gospel groups make this statement, but has really uh, brought to be true in that song that Phil just did. I heard a lot of gospel groups sing over the years, and many times they would make the statement after a song, there's enough gospel in that song to save the whole world if they just listen. That song right there, there's enough gospel in that song if people just listen, that could help everybody to come to faith in Jesus. Amen? From dust to glory. Okay, open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And while you're turning there, let me, let me mention a uh, couple little... I'll mention one statement, I'm going to tell you a little uh, a story. You know, we've talked in, this, in the book of Hebrews as we've been going through of, of our, about our great high priest, Jesus, and, and how much better he is than the Old Testament sacrificial system, <clears throat> and, and so forth. And, uh, but understanding this, that the old, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament sacrificial system, uh, a person could be uh, forgiven of their sins, but their sins couldn't be taken away like they are now when a person trusts Jesus as personal Savior. And I heard the example, uh, it would be, and it sort of, this sort of reminded me of a, uh, uh, one of my mentors uh, in ministry, and, and I myself have done a lot of the same things that my mentor did about this. And uh, that is that every, that every year, you would, uh, let's say that you take out a loan for whatever amount that is, and then it's, it's due in one year. <laughs> And at the end of that year, you go, uh, you go back because you don't have the money to pay off that loan. And so they just extend it for another year and then the interest for another year and, uh, and so forth. And, uh, so, and it never gets paid off, okay? It just keeps adding up <clears throat> until maybe one day something happens and it can be paid off. Now, by my mentor, what I was talking about with him, uh, and I followed his same example over the years uh, many, many times and still do, uh, and that is... Uh, paying taxes, okay? He said, well, Donnie, and this is S.S. Borb. He's probably preached to this church before. He said, I'll tell you what I did with, when I was on my taxes. He said, I, I never paid uh, uh, my estimates. He said, but I would go in every year and, uh, and get a loan and pay off my taxes for that year. Uh, and then he said, I would just take out a new loan for the, for the year coming. <laughs> he said, that's the way. I thought, well, you know what? If it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. So I followed that a lot over the years when it comes to tax season time. I many times I go in and, and, uh, and uh, when I started off, keeping it up now, <laughs> go in and, and, and take that and, and, uh, and pay that off, and then the, the next year I just do it again. Well, and the thing is, when we, when we think about our, our sins, though, and see, this is the way they were with their sins. Uh, the Day of Atonement, high priests go in, Day of Atonement, and pay off their sins uh, that they had committed for the year before, uh, but really... They were never delivered completely, so I guess one of the things we can say is sort of like that interest sort of kept, kept piling up. Well, I don't know if you all have ever heard of the, of the story uh, the, and the history of Sarah Winchester. How many people here have, have now or have owned a Winchester gun? Okay. Pretty good guns, right? Okay. okay. Well, Sarah Winchester... Uh, was the uh, uh, she was the heir and the widow of Mr. Winchester that that created all the, the Winchester uh, weapons and, and 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 produced all those uh, through the years. Now this was happened back in, in the 1800s, and this lady uh, she became heir to all that, but she was also involved in the occult, and uh, she had uh, she believed in a uh, in a in a spiritualist being able to tell her what to do, and so she had a medium that he told her that uh, Sarah. Uh, really, you, you are guilty from all those people that have died by the Winchester rifles. You're guilty of all that. That's on your conscience. <laughs> For all the people that have ever died by Winchester, that's, that's up to you. And he told her, said, what you must do, he said, uh, uh, you need to move to San Jose, California, and uh, there you need to build a home, build a house, but keep building on. Because the day you stop building on is the day you're going to die. And you're going to join your husband and your infant daughter. And so she listened to him. <laughs> and she, she went out there. And I don't know, have anybody ever heard of that Winchester mansion out there in San Jose, California? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a museum. And uh, it just scatters out. They said, you know, you could tell when you go in, there was no design to it. They just kept adding on and adding on because she didn't want it to stop. Now, some people say, well, she did stop for a certain period of time to give some people some rest. Other people say, oh, no, she didn't. <laughs> 
it just, it just kept going, kept going. And so because she felt like that there was guilt there, she was, she was trying to, to take the burden of that guilt upon herself for all those people that have died. Wouldn't that be a miserable way to live? <laughs> Amen? <clears throat> well, guess what? Probably, probably you and I may know some people that it may not be quite that drastic as you think about that, but you and I actually may know some people that they're also carrying around guilt. Carrying around guilt for something that, that they have done. I'll give you two examples real quickly. Uh, one was, there was a, there was a, uh, a lady uh, years ago that uh, I actually uh, led her to the Lord in the nursing home. And she was not that far from death. And uh, she said that, uh, and what she confessed to me was that she had a, uh, years before, she had had, uh, she had become pregnant and she aborted a baby. And this was actually before abortion was unfortunately popular like it is today in, in many circles. But she felt, she felt that guilt for all those years. And she felt like God could never save her because of what she did way back then. And so I helped her realize that God will forgive you of any sin you have ever committed. And so she placed her faith and, uh, and trust in, uh, in, in Jesus. And so with, uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to just kind of go, not, not mention the second one, all right? <laughs> we, we need to move on here. All right, so, but there are people that are living today that, that are carrying a lot of guilt. I will, I will tell you this other one. I was at my uncle's in, in Southern California. Had been doing a revival meeting there. <clears throat> and uh, this one uh, lady that he, my uncle was, uh, was a recovering alcoholic. And so this one lady that he had been her sponsor, uh, she came over one night and, uh, and, and wanted to talk. And, they, and, and, and actually, he and his wife, my uncle and his wife went to bed. <clears throat> and she wanted to talk. And her problem, again, was the same thing. She had had an abortion, and she felt like that she was still carrying that. She said, and my biggest problem is, she said, I know that God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself. <laughs> I said, oh, yes, you can. You, if whatever God forgives, we must forgive. Amen? And God, what, he put that all under the blood. You've been forgiven of that. Now, we need to realize that that's the way God works. When you trust him as personal Savior, trust Jesus, he takes away that sin. You should not feel the guilt. Now, when you... Once you trust Jesus as your Savior, you have the Holy Spirit living within your life. If you commit a sin, the Lord is going to, His Holy Spirit will convict you of that sin. Okay? And when He does, you need to confess that sin. And then when you confess it, forget about it, because He has. <laughs> you don't get up the next day and say, God, you remember that sin I committed that I asked you to forgive me for yesterday? Now, if you could hear Him say, He'll say no. Because <laughs> He's already forgot it. Amen? It gets under the blood, you ask Him to forgive you, and you go on. All right, I want us to look at a few verses here. In the first part of this 10th chapter, and then we're going to move, we're going to settle in on verses 19 through 22, uh, or through 25 when we get there. But I want you to look at, at uh, because really the, the uh, author of, of Hebrews here uh, is, uh, is going to make a transition. But watch this. In verse 1, he says, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, Make those who approach perfect or, or complete, mature, that word. Uh, verse 2, uh, For then would they not have ceased to be offered? <clears throat> for the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. Hence Mrs. Winchester, amen? This, is her, this was her problem. But watch this now, verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Okay, look at verses 9 and 10. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second, or the new covenant. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How many times? Once for all. <laughs> Amen. One time on the cross of Calvary, for the sins of the world when you place your faith and trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, this chapter 10, folks, is a, is a turning point in the book of, of Hebrews. We move from doctrine to duty. <clears throat> we move from belief to behavior. Now, Jesus is our great high priest. Amen? He is our great mediator. We talked about that last week. Now, verses 19... 
uh, through 25 uh, have, been, have been called the let us passages. Let us passage. Not let us. <laughs> Not garden lettuce, but let us. Let us. And you'll see that because this gives us a perfect outline for us to implement what we have learned and what our Lord Jesus Christ provides for us. So we're going to look at these. Now, now the first one, actually, the first let us is in verse 22, but we're going to back up and, and pick up verse 19 with it. I'll read, I'll read all of them, then we'll come back and hit them, all right? In verse 19, he says, Therefore, brethren, because of all this, Jesus being our high priest, paying this debt for us, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and a full assurance of faith, having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Verse 24, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So let's think about this. First of all, let us draw near in faith. Let us, are you following me? Let us draw near to him in faith. Now, when we think about this, there's eight, in these couple of verses here, there's eight dimensions to the meaning to draw near to God in faith. Eight dimensions. You see how so often we just read over a passage of Scripture and we miss out on so much, don't we? Until we back up and look into it and dig into it and see what God really has for us. God wants to, cha He changes our life whenever we trust Him as personal Savior, but folks, He wants to change our life every day, right? He wants us to just get it, to keep getting closer and closer to Him until the day he calls us home, okay? So, first of all, uh, the, uh, in, in first part of verse 19 there, we see the confidence of fellowship with God. The confidence of fellowship with God. Therefore, brethren, having boldness, having boldness to enter. This is the, the confidence that we have in him. Now, I want you to look back with me. Think about this boldness. Look back at... at uh, Chapter 6. Just per, turn over a couple of pages. Think about this, and we'll look at this, or we won't turn back to it, but we'll make reference later even. He says in verse 19, The hope that we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the present be, presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus has become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And so we have confidence now. We can come into the Holy of Holies. We can come into the presence of God through the blood that Jesus shed on the cross of Calvary. We come with boldness. Not, watch this now, not arrogance. Right? We don't come with arrogance, but we can come with boldness, knowing that He's paved the way for us to come into the presence of Almighty God. Okay. Now, the second part of that, uh, the, think about this, the cost of fellowship with God. The last part of that verse, the cost. We can enter in by the blood of Jesus. I've always said this to people. Salvation is free, but not cheap. Amen? Sometimes you think about anything is free. That doesn't get any cheaper than that. <laughs> Salvation is free for us, but it's not cheap. It costs God His only begotten Son. It costs Jesus His life's blood on the cross of Calvary. It costs Jesus going through everything that He went through as He was here in His 33 years upon this earth, going through all that for us. So there's the cost of of this fellowship with him. <clears throat> now, look at, uh, in, in verse uh, uh, 20, the first part, you see there the contrast of fellowship with God. The contrast there. <clears throat> in verse 20, the first part, he says, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us. So there's a contrast, and we've looked at it quite a bit in uh, going through these first nine chapters, but there's a, there's a contrast between the old way and the new way. The new way's better. Amen. In fact, we know now for us, on this side of the cross, it's the only way. And remember what I used as a, maybe it was not a great illustration, but it was a, it was an illustration. Old Highway 61, remember that? We talked about that. Remember those, how many people remember those old, old days of driving up Highway 61? 
Oh, wasn't that rough? Those hills and curves and, and all of that. And now there's the new way. Uh, Sherry is, is, and I are going to, my Christmas present is taking place tomorrow. <laughs> and Sherry and I are going to St. Louis tomorrow for my Christmas present. You want to know what that is? Ask me after church. And so anyway, we're going to be going up. We're not going to go up on 61. We're going to take Interstate 55. I'm setting my cruise control on 70, and here we go. <laughs> I may hit my brakes once in a while to go around somebody or come up behind somebody. I'm going to hit resume, and we're going to sail right up Interstate 55. Amen? And that's so much better. Don't go on 61 anymore. The only people that go on 061 anymore are the people that live on 61. <laughs> From north of, north of Fruitland all the way out through there. The people that live there, they still got to go that way. Well, some people, I think, hate to say it, there's some people that are still, like we talked about Miss Winchester, there's some people still living under guilt. Amen? There's some people still living under the old system. And we know that we have a living and a better way. We have a living Savior. Amen? We come to today to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Aren't you glad today that we're not having a funeral for Jesus? <laughs> Aren't you glad that every time we come together every Sunday, we don't have a funeral for Him. We have a celebration, a celebration of what He's done for us. Okay, so there's that contrast. And then the last part, you see the, 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 uh, the closeness of this fellowship uh, with God. Okay, look in, in the last part of, of, that, uh, of that verse, <clears throat> of verse 20. He says, through... The veil, that is his flesh. Now we know that when in, in Matthew chapter 27, 51, verse 51, tells us about this. When Jesus died upon the cross, he said it is finished. We know the veil in the temple that kept the, uh, the priest go, from going from the holy place into the holiest of holies. That veil was, was rent from top to bottom. Need, need to realize this also, that his flesh was open. Jesus' flesh was open. Nails, nail prints in his hand. Spear in his side. And so folks... A perfect picture of me, for me, uh, when I see Jesus dying on the cross. I see justice and mercy coming together. There has to be justice. The wages of sin is what? Death. And he has mercy on us. And so, you've seen the, the, maybe the paintings before. The question is asked, how much do you love me? God, how much do you love me? Jesus spread his hands like this on the cross and said this much. I love you this much. So he brought, he brought mercy, or he brought justice and mercy together on the cross of Calvary, shedding his blood, his flesh being open. And we go through, we go through that is, that was the, his cost of, uh, of, of fellowship. <clears throat> and it brings us to a, to a closeness to God. No other way, no other way for us to get there except through the death of Jesus on the cross. <clears throat> So that's, that access uh, gives us and, and cleanses us. Okay, now let's look at, uh, at verse 21. Verse 21, the creator of the fellowship is Jesus. Uh, in verse 21, and having a high priest who is? The high priest is who? Jesus, Jesus. And he's over the house of God. Remember when, when Jesus gave that promise to uh, uh, to Peter about uh, the church. He said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. Talked about the body of himself, the great massive rock. I'm not building my church, Peter, on you. Uh, you're, you're just a small pebble, okay? But on this big, massive rock, I'm building my church. And so Jesus is over uh, the house of God. He is the creator. Now, when we think about this, this fellowship, think about fellowship with, uh, uh, with, with God. Uh, the word fellowship means being in the presence, watch this now, being in the presence of another person and being made one. Wow. Think about that for a minute. Being in the presence of another and then being made one. That's fellowship. Well, really, you stop and think about the word fellowship. Fellows in a ship. <laughs> right? When you're in a ship together, boy, did I learn this lesson. I won't go into that details, but I learned this lesson one time many, many years ago uh, without, uh, uh, with canoeing and being in a boat. <laughs> when you're in a boat, you have someone else in that boat, boy, you sure need to be, have, be in one accord. <laughs> Amen. So that's fellowship with, with God. Jesus has done on that. He is in our heavenly sanctuary as our mediator, intercessor, and advocate to represent us as our high priest, 
before a holy God. Amen? Now, think about this in, uh, in verse uh, 22. Here it is now. We've built all the way up to this. Let us. There's that first let us. Let us draw near with a true heart. Let us draw near with a true heart. Uh, folks, did you get it when, it, that, that when he says let us, it is our responsibility to draw near to God. He's made the way already. But it's our responsibility to draw close to him. It seems basic, doesn't it? It just seems sort of a basic thing, but we need to be reminded of it. Now, the, the recipients of this letter, uh, this was strange and this was new to them. They couldn't be brought near in the Old Testament sacrificial system. Only the high priest is the one that could be brought near. But now we are the one that's to draw near. It's at the heart of Christianity, folks, drawing near to God. <clears throat> James talks about it in chapter 4, verse 8. Draw near unto God and he will do what? He'll draw near to you. You draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Remember in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart. Come before God with a pure heart, a true heart. Don't be a fake. Do you think there's some of that goes on nowadays? Some people are trying to come, they say they're trying to come close to God, but they're a fake. They're not really trying to draw close to Him because you can follow Him. And you know, and, and even, you know, you hear about some of the things that they say and do and so forth. And so you know that, that it's just a fake. Before we can see God, watch this now, before we can see God working in our lives, we need to have a true heart, a pure heart. And then we can see Him working in our lives. Amen? And even in, in the life uh, of, our, of our church. Okay. Now, uh, also, uh, look at, at uh, in, in th think about this, uh, the certainty... The certainty of fellowship with God. Uh, look back, and we need to do this uh, without wavering. Look at uh, just over a couple pages, maybe a few pages of James chapter 1. Look at James chapter 1. <clears throat> look at James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. He says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from God. For he is double-minded, he's a double-minded man and unstable in, in all of his ways. So we need to come with a, with a pure faith, amen, full assurance. Now, in, uh, in the last part of, of verse 22, he says, without wavering, he says, for he who promised is faithful. Who, sh who, sh who gives us the perfect and greatest example for faith? Jesus himself, Amen. He was faithful all the way to the cross of Calvary. Now, here in, in the last part of verse, of verse uh, uh, 22, when he talks about here, uh, I want to say something about this because uh, we, we kind of skipped over it. He says, having our hearts sprinkled with an evil conscience and our bodies washed uh, with, with water. It goes back to that Levitical system uh, again and the ceremonial law. That, uh, and that all had to do with the external but Jesus cleanses us from the inside. Amen. There is that removal of the guilt when we have trusted him. All right. Well, we're going to move on. Let's, let's look now. Thinking about let us hold fast. Uh, in verse, verse 23, let us, uh, let us hold fast uh, uh, without wavering. He's promised to be faithful. We, we, we have mentioned that. Uh, are, we, are we familiar with the difference in hope in the Bible and the hope the way we use that word today? Hope in the Bible, something it is not. Something it is not. It is not saying, well, I, I know it's cold today, and, and I sure hope it doesn't snow this week. <laughs> okay? Not, that's not that kind of hope. The hope that, that we have is the hope that we, that we mentioned in, in the, uh, chapter 6, verse 19. It's the I know kind of hope. Do you, know, do you remember the course of the, of the, of the, ver, of the song, I know? I know, I know, there's no doubt about it. He lives in my heart, and I'm going to shout it. I know, I know, my sins are forgiven, and I'm on my way to a place called heaven. Amen? That's the kind of hope that he's talking about here. It is a, it is a sure thing. It is our, the anchor of our soul. Now, lastly, let's, let us reach out in, in love, verses 24 and, and 25. Uh, 
Folks, I'm going to cut to the chase here, okay, uh, on, the, on this verse. And we're thinking about that. Here, if you remember, on the, uh, uh, the sermon, the New Year's sermon, we looked at this verse, things that we know that we ought to do in the new year. We know we ought to be faithful to our church, okay? I just want to mention this. This, this experience of, of, well, the expression of his love, verse 24, we need to keep our minds, eye, focused on each other. Considering. But what I, what I want to settle in on for a moment is this experience of this love. Uh, have you had someone ask you before, uh, can I be a Christian and not go to church? Well, the simple answer to that is yes, but. <laughs> now, I want you to listen to this. I thought this was something. Yes, it is possible, but it's something like being a student and not going to school. <laughs> huh? Being, being a student and not going to school. Or it's being a soldier and not joining the army. <laughs> Pretty hard, amen? It's, it's like being a citizen who will not pay taxes and will not vote. <laughs> okay? It's like... It's like being an explorer, but not having a base camp to go back to. It's like being a businessman trying to operate on a desert island. <laughs> Doesn't work too well. Amen? It's like being a seaman on a ship without a crew. <laughs> it's like being an author without any readers. How does that work for you? <laughs> Amen? It's like being a parent without a family. <laughs> it's like being, but this is good for today. This is a, today's a football day in America. Uh, uh, it's like being a football player without a team. How does that work out? <laughs> it's like being a scientist who doesn't share his findings. I love this too. It's like, being a bee without a hive. <laughs> so, is it, is it important to be active in your church? Amen, amen. Let me say real quickly, for folks, there's encouragement for, for us to, uh, to support each other and uh, in, in, in stir each other up in, in love and encouragement. We need to support and motivate each other. Come on, amen? We need to support, we need to support each other and motivate each other. Watch this now. We are encouraged. We come to, to, to church and we're encouraged from the truths in God's Word. Amen? We're encouraged by the truths in His Word. And also, when we, when we come to church, um, everybody is, has different kinds of a week last week. Amen? And to some people, they've had a harder time than other people. Now, we're, we're told to, to hold fast to this faith of ours. Amen? Okay, so sometimes we come and, and there are some people that, that need to be encouraged by some people that are holding fast to the faith. Okay? But guess what? Next week, those roles may change because all of us have different things going on in our lives. And so sometimes God comes through for us. We've held steadfast and sometimes somebody else, they've had some things happen and so then we encourage them. Amen? We encourage each other. There's so many people that miss out on so much by not coming and being part of God's church. I think we've, we've used enough examples there that we realize how important the church is. Amen. Amen. Okay, Brother Bill is coming. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. Miss Darlene is going to the piano. What are we going to sing, Brother Bill? 330. Number 330. Would you stand with me, please? Just come on up, Bill. That's all right. Number 330. You'll excuse me for just a moment, and I'll tell you later about what I'm doing. Okay? <laughs> okay. Now, let me say this this morning. Whatever decision that you need to make this morning, the Lord will help you make it. Amen? If you'll just be obedient to Him. Father, in Jesus' name, today we thank You for Your Word. We thank you, Lord, for how that you speak to our hearts through your word. And Father, we know it's so important for us to encourage each other. Lord, I know that 
I personally, I know that I need encouragement, and I know that everybody here today can say the same thing, uh, that we all need encouragement. So, Lord, uh, help us to uh, be the kind of church family that, and Lord, I see so much of this going on in our church, that we encourage each other, Lord, and help us never to give place to the devil, but help us to always encourage each other like you've instructed us to do in your word. Now we commit this invitation to you. We pray that each of us will be obedient to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You come as we sing. Some are going to come and be praying at this altar. Amazing grace.